Good evening and welcome to the Magpie Circle. Hope we've all thawed out a little bit from Wealdston and finally got back off the M1. Goalless and now eighth in the National League. But here's a few pointers for you to discuss tonight. Should we be showing more respect as fans to the smaller clubs in the National League? I heard a few grumbles and gripes again last night, but this is a club which has had to fight for its existence, uproot across London and climb back up from the equivalent of not far off the Nottinghamshire Senior League in the past decade or so. Remember when we used to gate crash Manchester United, Liverpool, the 80s, the 90s, and the boot was on the other foot in terms of revenues and resources? It's not that long ago we were rattling tins on Trent Bridge, was it, looking for Nottingham Forest to help us out? Maybe a bit of respect here and there. Um, the goalkeeping debate. Sam Slocum keeps Knott's first clean sheet in seven. But head coach Ian Burginal again specifically mentions in his post-match interview looking to bring in another goalkeeper with Anthony Patterson now back at Sunderland for the rest of the season. Would you be looking to strengthen there or would you be looking to strengthen elsewhere into Knott's current squad as we are well and truly in the second half of the National League season? Off to Bromley we go on Saturday. We know what to expect from them. Do you think we're going to handle it uh, and make it four points out of six from two trips to the capital, which I think we'd all be pretty satisfied with, irrespective of last night's result. Let's be having your thoughts. Welcome to Mel uh, Malcolm. Uh, welcome to Mark Stallard. Mark, uh, I, I, I don't think you were back till about one o'clock home last night after the game, were you? Yeah, yeah, about quarter past one it was. Yeah, the M1 uh, proved a mammoth task again last night, so... Uh, I think we averaged about 40 mile an hour all the way back uh, if we were lucky. So, yeah, one bit closed and uh, plenty of road work. So, yeah, the joys of travelling around this country at night. Yes, indeed. I was on the train, so but I wasn't back much before you, to be honest. Um, lots of debate, as there always is. Inevitably, more when we don't get the right result compared to when we do. I guess that's kind of how it is. Um, I thought there was one observation on Facebook that I just wanted to read out from... Um, Mark Sevens that I thought was kind of pretty accurate. Um, there's a big debate going on at the minute. We're rusty because we haven't played many games. The counter argument to that is, well, we should be fresh, not have many injuries because we haven't been playing too much. Uh, and Mark said, um, in response to some people saying, understandably, we're out of form because of lack of games, uh, said, yet the same people will be using the excuse of too many games when we start our run of Saturday and Tuesday matches. Take it for what it is, a bad result against a side in the bottom four, but no disaster looking at the results over the weekend by others. No game at this level is a given, despite certain fans' expectation. We will have to fight for every single point um fair comment still yeah absolutely fair yeah you're completely balanced and and yeah a very fair comment you know it's not the result we wanted of course not um not what not what Ian Birchnell and, and the players would have wanted but let's face it we we had a period where we didn't play we saw Chesterfield lose to Maidenhead we saw Maidenhead beat Halifax you know results go like that week in Say week in, week out, but most weeks you get a bit of an upset or a bit of a, a shock. We didn't get beat. It was nil-nil. We weren't quite good enough. We didn't really do enough to deserve all three points last night. Um, but, you know, you look at the, the sort of run of form. They're, they're by no means in a bad run of form, are they? You know, seven wins out of the last 11. Um, it was a blip. It was not the night that we wanted. But a clean sheet, a point. OK, people now look well, it makes more on the Bromley game, but you've always got to look to the next game. It wasn't the it wasn't the performance that they wanted. They, they, they were disappointing. And of course, then you go back to have we not played enough games? A bit stop start. People will twist that argument to fit whatever suits which side of the fence they sit. For me, I, I think, you know, they should have been nice and fresh last night, ready to come out of the traps. You know, the only disappointment you have with games called off. And I spoke to Ian Burcham before the game last night. And it is the fact that you you train and you prepare for games as they would have prefer, prepared for Barnet on Friday. So training is different. Your training sessions are different because you've got a game. And for that to be called off last minute means you've then got to 
quickly retweet what you've got planned between a Friday night game and a, and a Tuesday night game because that Friday night game obviously doesn't happen. So that's the inconvenience thing. But um, look, it wasn't the result we wanted, but it wasn't a disaster by any stretch. Um, Ian is clearly a very technical coach. Um, a lot of thought, preparation, process, meticulous in the way he puts on the training sessions, etc. Um Blank, blank midweek, I think, coming after that, it's going to be fairly hectic. Um, do you think, um, we know how you would have approached it and players years ago. Do you think the modern day footballer still wants to be playing two games a week? Because most players, are, certainly from a decade, would always say, don't, I don't need to try. two games a week, give me that all the time. There are more physical demands. I think players need to have a higher level of fitness these days, perhaps, than they yeah. did years ago. Um, wh wh where do you think that debate is? Well, I can absolutely guarantee they, are, they have to be fitter now than they, they were <laughs> years ago. I can guarantee you that. Um, again, without speaking to any of them, really, but I don't think the mentality has changed from give, give players games. That's what you want to do. You want to play. You want the chance to... To, to light up a game, you know what I mean? You, you, you don't get any thrills. As much as social media will try and push training sessions and things that happen on the training ground, you don't get any thrills, or I imagine you don't get too many thrills from scoring a worldie in training or having a great training session, because that counts for, for very little. Um, it's all about games, and I, can't, I cannot see that that mentality has changed one little bit. I think the players will have been frustrated at the games being called off in the in the recent weeks and not having quite as many games as they would have done. Um, but I think they'll be chomping at the bit to get to this run of games where things are obviously going to come a little bit thicker and faster now towards the end of the season because we've got these other games to fit to fit in and, and maybe one or two more rearrangements based on FA Trophy results as well. Uh, a few comments coming in. Kelvin Hallam, I like how Ian never used the lack of games as an excuse. Chris Gosling, no panic button being hit here, but I really don't feel the 352 works away from home. We have the personnel and flexibility to switch it up. Chris goes on to add the game uh, last night was akin to the early season games. A lot of passing across the opponent's 18 yard box and allowing the defence to line up and snuff us out. Andrew Webb comes in. Don't think any player has an issue with two games a week. The hardest part is the travelling. Um, let's just spend a little bit of time um, on last night's performance. Um, I think, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Um, we, we tend to, over the past couple of months, have played better in second halves than first half. First half, sometimes there can be an element of frustration. Second half, Ian's never afraid to make early changes, often at half time, change things around, formations. Uh, and then we kind of hit the accelerator pedal and win relatively comfortably. Kingsley, I guess, will be a prime example of that. It was a slow first half. But it didn't get much quicker second half, other than maybe the first ten minutes of the second half. Yeah, um, yeah, I think I think first half was was you know way below where they needed to be tempo wise and intensity and quality with the passing. Quite a lot of times you were at the game, Paul. Quite a lot of times players not under pressure were were not finding the target with a pass. That there wasn't the fluidity about the game and. And this is something we, me and Charlie have spoken about, and, and I, I mean, he's mentioned it to Ian Virtual as well. We aren't, I think, is it we're the lowest scorers in the first 30 minutes of games in the division? And, and is it, I've not come across that one. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. And, and, but, but conversely, we're then the highest scorers between 30 minutes and the end of the game. You know, as obviously opposite side of the same coin, if you like. So um, bottom line is, as long as you get the job done in football, it doesn't matter how and why and the wherefores you get you can worry about that afterwards uh but last night no first half was was no the, the passing was just nowhere near the quality the, the the tempo the intensity of the play was not right and that has become a bit of a uh well not necessarily the quality but it, they they what should we say struggled to break teams down early on in games mm. now you could also put the counterpoint that 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 is then because of the passing and the possession, they're moving the opposition around so much that when fatigue starts setting, and it's not just about fatiguing your legs, it's about upstairs mental 
switching off, making wrong decisions, the later the game goes, the, the majority of our goals come later in the game. Now, you could make a very valid argument to say that, that the first 30 minutes, OK, we don't you know seem to you know score early in too many games, but that could well lead to the fact that we score quite a few later on in games because opposition teams get tired chasing the ball, having to make loads of decisions. Do I close a man down? Do I just sit off? Are we pressing high? Are we sitting off? All them sort of things. So, um, look, for, for every argument, you can make a counter-argument. Yeah. But, but it is something that has been noted, I think. not Don't start games, i say brilliantly well. I wouldn't say they start badly, but sometimes they maybe lack the intensity. I think we've had a few games, and, and certainly with the Kingsling game and Wheelstone last night, the first half you could look at and say, you know, not really where we want to be. Now, Kingsland, they've got a bit of a caveat. The pitch wasn't perfect, but but last night, no such caveat. It was it was a good pitch last night. So um, it is something that's been noted, and it's something we'll keep an eye on. But ultimately, it's about getting the job done over ninety minutes. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get that done from a three point perspective. Kian Henton, disappointing result, but a point's a point. Every point counts if we are to try and get out of this league. Lee Swanick says, tell Stell to sort that bookcase out. It's all over the <laughs> shop. <laughs> even your book. We're not happy. We're not oh. happy. The flock is not happy. We're even complaining right. now. In addition to Wheelston's just about They're not everything. real books. I can't even read that. There'll be picture books if they're up there for uh, me. Hey, it's it's because it's because you've got one flew over the magpie's nest, 600 pages at one end. So it's tipping right. everything else open. Yeah. Well, it is. Um, but not. Z Zedo, uh, we do have some players like Ruben who has barely played for two months. He needs game time, but he's not match shot. No reserves or even friendlies makes actual first team games uh, an only option. Um, I guess the what the flair players didn't really do it or didn't get involved as much as you would hope. I mean, Ruben, is it too unfair to say the game passed him by last night? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it is. I think that. He didn't get. Well, he didn't, wasn't able to exert any influence on the game, really. Ruben, I think. I think Cal saw more of the ball. Yes. End product wasn't great, um, but look, look, you know, looked lively coming off his hat trick at, at Kings Lynn. So, um, yeah, look, it was for me. It was just one of them games where it didn't really happen. Now, if that was happening week in week out, we'd go, mm, yeah. But because, you know, they won six games consecutively before that. And yes, we know that's been stretched out over a long... And I'll take the FA Trophy games out of it because I prefer just league stats, really. Because that's what we want, promotion and all that sort of thing. But, you know, they're in a decent run of form. So one, it's not even... A, it's a blip, isn't it? We can call it. It's, it's you know, we wanted three points. We didn't get three points. But as somebody... Well, everybody really knows... No team's going to roll over for you. You have to earn it. And if you're not right, and last night proved it, you know, not that it needed proving, if you are not right, if you're not right at it and, and at the top of your game, then within any league, any sort of upset result, but a nil-nil is not, not, not necessarily an upset. It just we didn't have the quality to really to really go and win the game. And, and that'll be the disappointment. They've got to put that right Saturday. Uh, Stephen Orton, good evening all. Royston, uh, <laughs> Royston's a bundle of laughs. Sorry to say we will be lucky to get into a playoff place. Cool, blimey, I dread to think what that would mean. Uh, Chris Gosling will finish fifth minimum, Royston. Don't panic. Um, we've talked a lot about knots. I actually didn't, I thought Wealdstone were a pretty well organised unit. You know, I, th I think the is the keeper on loan from Fulham or somewhere. I thought he yeah. was quite decent. They've, yeah. got, they've clearly got some strong, powerful players, uh, players with a with a reasonable degree, I thought, of athleticism. Um, and it, I think, as you know, Mark, it, it annoys me sometimes. Uh, and I've got to say, this is not not as players, certainly not Ian. I, I do think sometimes there's a little bit, almost too much um, uh, uh arrogance with some of our supporter base uh, you know some sort of like you know supremacy that we've got you know you've always got to respect the opposition you're not going to worry about them but I think you've got to respect them I actually thought we didn't really get around the back last night did we or turn their, their defense but I thought they I thought they were a pretty well organized unit and you know I I wouldn't have said watching them last night that they were a bottom four team in that division 
No, no, I agree, you know, completely with that. I think um, you see it at all levels, don't you? I mean, they started out, you know, they were getting men behind the ball. There was, a, you know, back four. They started with a back four, which might have thrown knots a little bit, maybe thinking yeah. they were going to match them up. And But then five men acro across the middle of the park. And and they made sure, and I talk about gaps in football between your defence and your midfield, they made sure when they didn't have possession, because they probably knew they weren't going to have loads of possession against knots, that them gaps were small and they were congested in the middle of the park. Knots tried, it, particularly early on, a lot of diagonal balls and they couldn't find their range with the passing. And so really struggled to get in behind them, struggled to get that stretch, if you like, uh, early on in the game. And I felt Wheelstone grew into the game. They, I think they grew with a bit of confidence and belief that, hey, we've got a team here that maybe aren't at it. You know, and that, again, it just reiterates the importance of a start in a game. If you set out the traps really fast, first 15 minutes or so, I, I've done it in, in my career all that, you know, loads of times been on the receiving end and for it. If you start fast, the opposition automatically go, or oh, they're bang at it. So you automatically or subconsciously, you all take a little bit of a defensive step and take a little bit of a defensive mindset and go, well, if they're at it, we'd better make sure we, we sit back and don't concede. And then it becomes a bit of attack v defence, if you like, at times. I think last night, Notts didn't do that and that allowed Wilston to, to come into the game and believe a little bit more. And that gave Notts one or two problems in that they couldn't keep the keep the ball long enough and certainly not in the final third. The final ball was so poor at times last night and set mm. pieces particularly poor. Um, so it, it, credit to Wilson. I can say it on the radio, you know, credit to them. They had bodies thrown in the way. They had loads of bodies in the way. But... You see it at any level of football, Champions League games, international games, Premier League games, where you see a so-called lesser team against a so-called stronger team, they will automatically concede a bit of territory, concede a bit of possession and go, we'll just be tight and get bodies behind the ball and go, come on, come and break us down. And last night, Notts didn't have the quality to do that. Second off, they were better, um, but still didn't have that, that final ball, that final bit of incision. Um, and didn't test the keeper often enough. You know, he made a couple of saves, but not one that you would say, well, he, he's no right to get to. I think was, the one from Richard Brindley was probably his best save. Yeah. And that was a 30-yard yeah. shot. So he's had time to move and, and get fingertips to it. So um, I think that's the thing. In the final third, knots weren't quite uh, ruthless enough, Weren't were, didn't have the quality on the final ball. Uh, goodness me, says Neil Woodison, we draw one and people panic. Greg Simmons, just remarkable how competitive the top of National League is. No one particularly looking like falling away yet either in virtual evening. Oh, Benny Boy, 29. Slow start as seems to be the norm this season. But credit to Wilston, defended the box well and never gifted us anything. Draw was a fair result on the night. In virtual, Wilston deserved credit for how resolutely, resolutely they defended last night. And he has, uh, have I warmed up yet? Yeah, I had the Under Armour military grade long johns on last night because it was a bit parky as we say around these parts um but uh yeah i saw someone say it was there on 111th i need to add up how many grounds i've watched knots on there i i know it's over 150 but i'll have to have a i'll, I'll have to have another little look um i don't know who, who else else out there has done their maths on how many grounds you've seen knots play uh, a first team fixture at I would suspect someone must be probably touching 200 um, we do tend to sample all divisions uh, Zedo our last promotion season when we got out of League 2 we played Saturday Tuesday most weeks for the second half and got in a good rhythm we need to work on the away form and find a way against uh, find a way against lower league teams Chris Gosling we will encounter that in a lot of away games I think it is worth trying a different approach, particularly against lower half opponents. I want to come on to away form in a minute, um, but I think there's been quite a bit of debate. Um, goalkeeping, goalkeeping. So um, clearly, uh, Anthony Patterson was a crowd favourite. He's gone back up uh, to Sunderland and... I don't think we'll be seeing him again this season. So Sam Slocum is back between the posts. Um, there are some fans that seem to have a bit of a downer on him. Uh, he got Knotts' first clean sheet in seven games last night. Um, but Ian has mentioned and said so again in the 
after-match interview with BBC Radio Nottingham, um, that he was actively looking um, to bring in another keeper. Um, first, uh, so, firstly, Stel, um, what do we think of Sam? And as an ex-player, how does a player, and particularly a goalkeeper, because you can't have two goalkeepers, if you're a midfielder, then there might yeah. be four midfielders and you've got six and you can juggle them around. A goalkeeper is either in or he's bang out, isn't he? Um, how does that affect the mindset of a professional footballer? Does he feel the pressure? Does he respond to it? Are you surprised at all? What, what What's your take on it? I think, first and foremost, I rate Sam Slocum as a good goalkeeper. I've said that before. And I will also say, since Anthony Pesson went back, he came in and made two or three errors. You know, so that didn't do his case any good, obviously. But I think he's experienced enough to know, look, yeah, I've made errors. He'll have made plenty before in his career and he may well make plenty more, but hopefully not, not for a while. But um so that that will be okay and i think he, he's old enough played enough games to to sort of that's a little bit water off a duck's back the okay. fact of of the the manager coming out saying he's going to look for another keeper again you can take that any which way you want and it comes down to the individual to, to sam slocum um i think he'll be secure enough in his career and what he's done and his own abilities to go I fully expected that because all we've got is Tiernan and Brooks, a young goalkeeper, promising goalkeeper. But I think the reason they want to bring somebody else in is a to strengthen the goalkeeper position to provide some real competition because you know they want to see Tiernan and Brooks get some men's football, you know, competitive men's football by going out on loan. But obviously, you can't do that if we haven't got a backup keeper to you know in the case of case of any injury or any problems, you know, just before a game, whatever. I know we don't have a keeper on the bench other than the FA Trophy, but um, that's a little bit different. But obviously, he wants to bring somebody in to to maybe light a bit of a fire. And Sam's like, I don't mean it like that. I mean just provide that competition for places and say, look, when you when you whoever's in whatever position, we've got it pretty much out, outside, you know, around the team, the outfield players. It's the goalkeeping position. You want two competitive first-choice keepers fighting for that number one spot. And when Anthony Patterson came, he got the number one spot and didn't really do anything wrong. The only the only uh, mistake or slight mistake I can remember him making was one of the Halifax goals, which, you know, we, we've tried best to forget that night. But um, he was a good goalkeeper. The difference is between Anthony Patterson or a young goalkeeper and Sam Slocum, who's mid-30s now, you know, is that ability with your feet. Mm. All goalkeepers now have I say, got to. It's part of the arsenal. Yeah. Peter Shilton, who was one of England's best ever keepers, he would have hated. If he'd have been born now, he'd have had to learn to use his feet. Yeah, He was still a phenomenal goalkeeper, but he would have had to learn to use his feet. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to play pretty much nowadays. So, yeah, Sam Slocum is... is or was behind Anthony Patson in terms of, of use with the feet. There's there's no two ways about it. Anthony Patson is part of this new breed of goalkeeper. And I believe that if Ian Birchall goes and gets another goalkeeper, it will be somebody of a similar ilk, similar age, um, with that exact same remit. Because the way knots play, we do require, or it certainly helps if we've got a keeper who is proficient with the ball at his feet in terms of being able to spray one to the right wing back, to the left wing back, to accept passes from one of your centrals and go out the other side. And to also, if you are being pressed, to be able to control it and knock it up the pitch if needs be. So, you know, that that is, but that's part and parcel of a remit for any goalkeeper nowadays because the way the game's gone. Uh, Ian Birchinell says, uh, Sam had a good game last night, except that one instance in the second half where it kicked it to their player. Neil Woodison uh, adds, um, teams raise their game uh, because we are a so-called um, big scalp. Um, OK, so um, that's the goal kicking situation. I want to drill down a little bit. Um, away form. OK. Um, our away form collection of points. Um of the uh, top eight, nine, uh, it's the worst. One, and it's not bad. One, four, drawn, four, lost, three. Um, clearly, we have games in hand, although we're eighth. Um, 
But it is interesting looking at some of the breakdown um, of the other clubs. So Wrexham, for instance, we have games in hand. Um, they've played 14 away, 10 at home, 10 at home. Stockport have played 13 away, 11 at home. So it is quite right. We have games in hand. But I think the picture is a is a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and certainly to make ground, um, our home form is good. Um, would you say, Snell, it's our away form that's kind of the difference between us being second, third? And being eighth, and clearly they're relatively small margins, but we've won four out of uh, eleven away games. And given, if you're looking for the ninety point mark, you got to win quite a few away as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the stats back that up, don't they? I mean, if you're saying we've taken sixteen points on the road and we've got twenty six points at Meadow Lane, you know, the stats back that up. But then that is not unusual in football is it that your home record should be better than your away record in theory yeah. um and the so, point is we talk a lot about the, the the games in hand but but there is an imbalance with some of the clubs above us who have played a lot more away games than home yeah and so yeah, you would be course, expecting yeah. them to be weighing in with points which clearly puts pressure on us you know to win these games to win these games to make the inroads in absolutely yeah you know of course there's pressure on every game to win the game if you want to be let's face it we're talking about being top of the tree we're talking about being first in the in the division you know we're, we're back at that that that's the goal you know so if you're talking about that you've got to win games home away you've got it sounds absolutely stating the obvious but you've got to win the majority of your games now yes you can afford a slip up like last night every team is going to have a slip up um, you know, and a point away from home while it, a slip up against Wilson is not the end of the world. And yes, I get you what you're saying about Wrexham have got a load of at home games to come, which again, we do that thing of predicting they'll probably win the bulk of them, yeah. which we know football doesn't necessarily always come true. You know, like I say, I go back to the games at the weekend, you know, Maidenhead had, had a week, you wouldn't believe, <laughs> beating Halifax and Chesterfield. Nobody could see that coming. And that will happen from now till the end of the season. So it, we can get caught up in what are other teams doing, what imbalances are there. Knots have got to try and find a way of winning at home and away. So the away bit that we're trying to address, what is it that they can do possibly away? And again, I, I, I back Ian Birchall up and say the last two away games, Kings Lynn and Wealdstone, the first halves, it didn't happen. He made a proactive change in both games at half time to not only change personnel, but change the shape of the team to go from the back three that we played for the massive majority of the season to a back four. It worked unbelievably well at Kings Lynn yeah. and it didn't work with so much effect last night. And that's that's the way it can go as a manager. What, what you've got to do is, is get the players, it's easy said than done, get the players to start the game a little bit sharper. I think to really, particularly in them sort of games, go as if, right, we want to get two goals in the first half. Let's get up, get in front. Let's really hit them. Take a risk or two against them sort of teams. Push your wing backs on, play high up the pitch and get on that front foot. So easy to say, not so easy to do because like last night, if your passing's not right, then you keep giving the ball when you keep having to trek back towards your own goal. But um, of course, we are going to have to pick up the away form, you know, if we want to go for that top top spot. But it's not it's not disastrous away form we're talking about. No, no, it's, it's, it's not. pretty good. It just could do with win the next two games and all of a sudden next two away games and all of a sudden we're going, it's a really good away record we've got. Mm -hmm. Added added to a, a good home form. And I say the team that wins this division, you could bet your bottom dollar and not going to be sat there with a poor record home or away because they wouldn't have the points otherwise. But yeah, it, it the imbalance of points does say, yes, we need to try and pick up more points on the road. Do you think using a flat back four is something that they might look at or not? Or stick tried and trusted 3-5-2? And only when that doesn't work do they, does, does, is a switch made. 
Yeah, I think I think the the latter there. What you said, I think they'll stick with what they've done because they will work and work and work on it. And let's face it, it's worked pretty well throughout the season. But we always talk about having a plan B, and they will work on right. If we make a change, we want to go to a four. This is what we do, and and these are the patterns of play, and these are what we're looking to do. These are the areas we want to get players into, uh, and and the ball and and things like that. And let me say last night. We struggled really to to get Cal and Ruben, the two creative players, most creative players really, to try and, and get a strangle hold of the game, get hold of the game and allow the two wing backs to bomb on. Jaden Richardson, we tried at every opportunity to get him in. Yes. And you know, he, he nearly had one kicked off the line, didn't he? Um yeah. but it, it, it never quite worked. But he's a real threat. So the more we could get the ball into them creative players, you know, last night they couldn't find the pass that unlocked the key. Uh, you know, unlock the door. But you can bet your bottom dollar if they keep getting the ball in there, more often than not, they will. Um, but last night, it just wasn't to be. But again, I go back to that is on the back of six wins on the spin. Yeah. So we can't be too critical about it. No, no. Admittedly, that away form is worse than the home form. But again, that's not unusual in soccer. <laughs> Small margins. And, and, and they're the sort of games, aren't they, away from home, where you want the 91st minute winner, don't you? You know, Graben did it for Forrest at Millwall the other week, you know, uh, yeah. right at the end. And I, I, I don't know what your thoughts were, because I was behind the goal. And I think we all thought that moment was about to come. Cal Roberts has got it, drifts past one, drifts past two. He's on his favoured left peg, yeah. middle of the goal. And I think we all thought, right, the, twiggers, the trigger's going to be squeezed, bottom corner. And of course, he passed it out to Kyle, didn't he? Yeah. Um, which surprised me because I, th I, I don't know whether you had a better angle of it than me. It looked like it was set up for Kel to shoot. For well, whatever what he felt think... the better option was to pass. But yeah, you know, I think with it, with it being so late in the game, Paul, I think he he, he like sold a dummy, sold another dummy, and cut inside. And you think he's in... and I think there were a couple of defenders throwing themselves at it. Right. And in the split second, maybe that he's thinking, he's thinking, well, I could hit this. But with last minute, last couple of minutes, they're throwing them. It's probably going to get blocked. And that must mean Carl Wooden's got time. And if I slot him in, he'll go and score. And because he got it a little bit stuck under his feet. And, and a, the lad proves a decent block. He didn't really have a, a great You, you shot want to really. pass those still, would you? I might have done if he was on my left foot and at the edge of the box. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go past three players. No. That you want to no. drop the shoulder and ghost him past them, wouldn't you? <laughs> Ghosting past three players is foreign language to me. So, uh, no, I mean, yeah, admittedly. But then again, if I was stood where Carl Wooten was stood, I'd have been screaming for a pass. So, yeah, uh, yeah, they, 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 yeah, I wouldn't take what I would do as any sort of beacon of what, of what should be done because, yeah, I always wanted the ball and always wanted to try and shoot. But, um yeah, look, it, it's not a disaster last night. It wasn't what we wanted, of course. And players didn't hit the peak. There was nobody coming off the pitch going, well, he was he was a nine out of ten today. Yeah. You know, so not what you wanted. We've got to move on. Um, got to ask, you mentioned Chesterfield. Um, uh, this story broke before our Monday night show. Um, and, and look, we none of us know. Well, maybe you do and you can't say too much. Um, what, what would you make of what's going on um, at Chesterfield? I mean, I am struggling to rem to recall a time when a manager has been suspended in in this kind of manner when they've been so successful. You know, fair enough, and it can be used as leverage or an excuse to get rid of them after they've lost yeah. eight on the trot. You know, we all know how, we all know how these things work. I'm struggling to remember this kind of scenario happening before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we were speculating about it before the game last night. Me, Charlie, and Lee Curtis were there, and and, and honestly, none of us know anything. None of us know any what's really gone on. Um, the one thing I would say, and again, only speculation, only my opinion, um, is that to be sort of top of the league, or okay, no, they're not top of the league now, but top of the league, suspending your manager, and and let's be honest. You don't see many managers or anybody getting suspended and then getting reinstated do you later down the line. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine a line has been crossed in in whatever area we're talking, but a line has been crossed that that they've obviously felt they've got no other alternative, and and they feel they're doing and hopefully feel they're doing the right thing. You know, if there's something happening, it's it's not 
dissimilar to the Morris Ross thing with not. So, you know, let's not all get on a high horses and pious about things. Um, but things yeah, can we happen. We had lost about eight on the trot at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 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 think, but what I'm saying is things can happen, Paul, and things can get said no, and cross a line and they have yes. to be dealt with irrespective of league position or perceived value to the club. And, and you know, when it comes out, we might be going, well, to be fair to yeah. Chesterfield and the hierarchy, fair play to them for dealing with it as they have done instead of trying to sweep it under the carpet to protect a manager that seems to be doing a, a, a decent job for them. So if he's crossed a line and, and then it gets dealt with, then then so be it. But but that's that's my thoughts. It's not with any inside knowledge or anything of anything there. But yeah, I hope it gets dealt with and, and dealt with properly. And you know that that's how it should be dealt with, irrespective of league position. Okay, um, so that's Wealdstone. Uh, on we go, Bromley, Saturday. Um, difficult team to play against. Um, and it would appear, because I think a lot of us thought Andy Woodman was on his way to Gillingham. Mm -hmm. Bromley gave um, him uh, permission, I think they used the phrase reluctantly, to speak to Gillingham. Mm -hmm. uh, but Andy came out at the weekend and basically has poured cold, poured cold water on it and is now focusing uh, on Bromley. Um, he's clearly a big part of what they're achieving down there. Are we surprised he's, are you surprised he's still there? Do you think he would go to um, I Not knowing it. I don't know him at all. Um, a little bit, a little bit. Um, but obviously, he perhaps feels he, he can go further with Bromley. Usually, managers move if they think, you know, if they get an inkling, if they're being honest with themselves. I've probably took them as far as I can go. Glass ceiling. And my stock is as high as it's possibly going to be. But then that's when you tend to find managers are... Yeah, we'll go and speak to a, high, a club in a higher league and 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 move on. Um, that's obviously not the only reason, but but that's generally the feeling you get. Now, credit to him, it might just be old-fashioned loyalty, you know, or he might just feel that I've got a real chance with a not so fancy team to do something pretty good of getting Bromley into the football league. Um, and as we've seen with Harrogate, with Salford, with um, Barrow, you know, these teams that are no history in the Football League, they can get in the Football League. You know, they can get there. It's not impossible. As you mentioned, glass ceiling, it's been broken in terms of that. So he might just fancy, do you know what? I've got a good set of players. Uh, we, we, you know, we've got a good way of playing. We all know the job uh, and we've got a real chance. And he might just want to see it through. Because, again, for his CV alone, that would be a gargantuan achievement, you know, for Bromley to be to be right up there and fighting to get in the Football League. You know, not a massive su surprise to those of us that, that have seen him over the last couple of years, but it would be a hell of an achievement and viewed in the football world as a really big achievement. Um, very well drilled, very well organised. You know exactly what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. Um, but it delivers them results. And, and and I guess if you if we cast our minds back to the game at Medal Aim midweek, um, we got in front and then they kind of did what they do best and got a point, didn't they? You know? Yep. Yep. They, they, they keep you honest is, is as good a way of describing them as anything. They keep you honest because... They will put the ball in your box and, you know, long throws, we know they're a weapon, but set pieces as well. They've got big lads, but they can play a little bit as well. And Michael Cheek, they've got up front. I've been an admirer of him at this level for a few years since I've seen him. Um, I like him. He's clever. He's not just, you know, head on a stick or anything like that. He's, he's a clever goal scorer, a clever player. Um, but around and about him, they, they seem to have, a way of playing one or two good little players, you know, so they can play. It's not just long ball. It's not just whack it, it get it in the opposition half at all. We saw that at Meadow Lane mm. early on this season. Um, they're combative. Um, they're, they're a decent team and they're up there on merit at this moment in time. So it'd be a very, very tough test down there. And obviously the plastic pitch, uh, you know, that that's uh, an extra thing to, to bear in mind, a bit of a, 
uh, a factor for them, obviously, in their home ground, their home pitch. They know it well. Um, so, yeah, really tough test. Hey, look on the bright side, no pitch inspections on the way down this weekend. No, absolutely, yeah. We can be confident there's going to be, well, I'm going to touch wood still, but we can be confident there's going to be a game, yeah. Um, um, I say, the, the plastic pitch, again, Ian Birchall went on, on record as saying he's, he's praying for rain, doesn't he? Because it is, it is, and I know exactly what he means, it is a slow, sticky plastic pitch. And uh, you can bet your bottom dollar they're not going to be putting the sprinklers on it too much before the game. So, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of home advantage, isn't it? So it's no different to years gone by when some, certain clubs used to grow the grass long in corners and, and all that sort of thing. So it's it's another challenge. It's a challenge for Knox that against a good team in their home patch. So really tough game. Um, I think I've asked you this. Well, I know I've asked you this before, and and you uh, and you know point away, etc. And you said no, you, you never go for a point. You go you you, you go for the win. Yeah. Um, how important is three point Saturday from a short term perspective? Because on the, ordinarily a point at Bromley, yeah, mm. it's a decent result. Yeah, it's yeah. a decent result. Uh, but we haven't won at Wealdstone. Um, does that is that in any way, shape, or form changes Ian's mindset to this game or not? I don't think so. I, I think you've got to address every game, the old boring cliche, but you've got to address every game as an individual challenge. You know, you, you can't, you know, if, if you were going to use that that sort of um, argument to say, well, we only got a point at Wheelstone, so now we, we go a bit more gung-ho and we go for all three points because it's all three points or nothing against no. Bromley, you could then use the sort of counter-argument Ah, but we've won four games before the Wheelstone game, so it doesn't matter quite as much on the back of that. You've got to take each game in isolation. And that's why they'll believe they can win every game. There's not a team, boring old me, I know, but there's not a team in this division that on any given day, Knox cannot be and beat fairly convincingly, home or away. Again, you comes. It's not going to happen like that. You have off days and good days, and everything clicks and days where it doesn't happen. But there is not a team that, if not play well, I I see them. I don't see them beating. So go down to Bromley. Exert your influence on the game. You know, match them. Yes, you're going to be asked questions. You've got to defend your box really well. Um, but when you get the ball, go and play and believe because. Remember the game at the end of last season where we got beat 1-0 down at theirs? We, we say, battered them first off, but we were the better team by far the first off. Didn't score, didn't get the goal. And then, you know, to be fair to them, they came out, they roused themselves second off and got themselves in the playoffs. Um, but again, I, I would go back to that. You were the better team. You are the better team. If you play well, I would say this to Knox, every game, if you play well, you win the game. You don't draw the game, you win the game. But again, that comes down to having that playing well, that little, that bit of X factor, that bit of quality in the final third that we didn't have last night. But didn't mean we played badly. It just means we didn't hit the heights. So Saturday, we've got to play better than last night, you know, and have a little bit of X factor and a little bit of devil in the final third. And who knows, you know, because no one happened, no one scored last night, there might be one or two. Extra last, uh, extra for Saturday sort of thing. You know, your Cal Roberts, your, your Ruben Rodriguez thinking, I've got a point to prove here. I, didn't, I could have scored the other night. I didn't. Right, we've got to up it a little bit. It's, it's weird how funny that our football goes. You can draw away at Wealdston and who knows, we could go and beat Bromley three or four on Saturday. There's no rhyme or reason and there's often no correlation between one game and the next game. Even though there's only four days between them, that's gone. wheelston has gone. Park it. Now it's it's all about Bromley. Uh, Chris Gosling says, with the form Stockporter in, we need three points if we want to keep them in touching distance. I think we're seeing points on the board psychologically is more beneficial than games in hand. ZO, last two seasons, at least one team has gone up on an inverted commas ordinary budget. Will this season book the trend and money wins out? Or will a team like Boreham Wood, Solihull, etc., end up going up? Chris Gosling adds, 
Boreham Wood and Bromley are where they are on merit and fair play to them. Um, so many different narratives to the top nine who, let's be honest, are, are all in it and all are well and truly in it. There's some teams we would have expected to drop out by now, Dagenham, but they, they keep coming back, bouncing back, getting a result or two here. Um, on the face of it, and Boreham Wood, let, let us be realistic, they're not the paupers that many would have you believe. They have a good, you know, people in the game will tell you they have a good budget, but nevertheless, they struggle to get 1,000 fans into their ground for a home game. You know, it's often eight, nine hundred. Um, they sold their star striker at the start of the season. Um, they are fighting, not on two fronts, like Knotts and Stockport, Wrexham, in terms of adding the trophy. They're fighting on three fronts, three fronts with the FA Cup as well. Now, um, has it surprised you still? Because we play so many mind games here, don't we? You know, every club comes up with a reason why, you know. So there is a narrative among some Knotts fans. Well, we've not played many games. It's been a stop start. We've been hit by COVID. We've had some dodgy postponements. Blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. I think if you're trying to look at it dispassionately, of all the clubs in that top nine, you'd probably say Boreham Wood so far. I don't know what you think, have actually performed better than anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Them, uh, possibly Halifax. You know, you'd probably, I'd, I'd probably say I wouldn't see Halifax being right up there. And if I'm being honest, I don't see him being right up there come the end. I, I think they'll be, again, similar to last season, sort of at playoffs, pushing playoffs. Um, but Boreham would have been a real not a surprise package. But when, you, when they sold Schumanger, and say, so, and let's not forget again. Silver Thomas went earlier last season went yeah. to Huddersfield. Um, so you lose a couple of real, real influential players. Uh, certainly at the attacking end of the pitch. Then what do you do? But you you look at it in detail. And you go, well, you've got to give Luke Garrard credit. Yes. For for replacing them, despite not notwithstanding whatever whatever budget he's got. And the reason why, and I was saying to you before we started. They're the leading team in terms of clean sheets in this division. Out of 22 games, they've got 13 clean sheets, which is incredible. By far the best defensive record in the league. Not as prolific as Knox or all the teams around them. But if you keep 13 clean sheets, you've got a good teamwork ethic. You're hard to beat, obviously, hard to break down. But that doesn't come from spending fortunes on defenders because teams don't. But it comes from good, good training, good togetherness, and players knowing their jobs again. And you know, again, we talk about knots as an attacking force. We'd like a few of them clean sheets for ourselves, yeah. and then we'd be a fair few places higher up the league. So you know, you've got to give Luke Garrard credit and the players, obviously, because it's them that has to go and do it. But but absolute credit for that. Thirteen clean sheets in twenty-two games. That is no mean feat in this league um, or in any league. So. You know, credit to them. Does that mean that they're going to fall away? Well, I would say no, because if you've got a solid base, you don't see them suddenly conceding threes and fours every week to lose games. They might not score shed loads and they might not win loads of games. So they might have a lot of draws or whatever you're coming up, but you would fancy that they're going to stay the course unless they get key injuries or anything like that. But uh, yeah, just a surprise package. In terms of what they've done, yeah, I think that, you know, really have with Shimanga going, yeah. Um, Stockport are, given what's happened at Chesterfield in the past three days, mm. I think Stockport now would probably be most people's favourites. Dave Challen has done it once. He, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? He's leaving Hartlepool. He's the devil incarnate, you know, goes to Stockport gets the results and all of a sudden he's the messiah and it's, this is how things change in football isn't it you know all, all driven by by results um would you say at the minute stockport are the team to beat or is it or, or is it too early is he you know he's still got a lot you know well yeah they're attracting yeah. a lot of attention aren't they a minute on the run yeah. that they are on because stockport went down the big money route and it yeah. wasn't working you know it's a classic example isn't it they've splashed the cash remember when we played them didn't look, didn't look great, did they? Didn't look great. 
but he's clearly done something in a short space of time. Yeah, I think we've kicked a lot of them into gear, haven't we? <laughs> Since we played them at Meadow Lane. Um, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're flying at the minute. I, it's no coincidence, is it, that, that a team hits the top of the table and all of a sudden they're the favourites and we all fancy them to, to yeah, win. We were saying the same about Chesterfield, what, two, three weeks ago. Um, f- I think for me, more broadly, I think Stockport's certainly going to be in it. But I've said right from the start of the season, and I don't think I can change my mind now. I've not seen anything to tell me to change my mind particularly. You look at the teams that spent money, Stockport, Chesterfield, Wrexham. Still don't, they're circling towards the top. They might not have hit the top early doors, but they're circling towards the top. Then who you look at, you look at your likes of a Boreham Wood, a Bromley. Are they going to go the course, uh, sorry, the distance? Halifax, are they going to stay the distance? Grimsby looked like they were flying, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Ten games ago, all of a sudden they bit the skids, but could come again. Um, Solly Hull, always there or thereabouts. So you've got that, and then you've got knots. You sort of it sat quietly in the middle of all that sort of thing. So I still think that them three that have spent the money, I think knots. Um, I th- I, Dagenham Redbridge will lose too many games, I think, personally, to be right at the top. I don't think I would look any any further than than the three with money plus knots for the very top spot. Again, I might be proven wrong. I'm a, I'm a horrible uh, sort of predictor, but uh, but that that is what, what I do. I, I just see. I say they're spending even more money, aren't they? And yeah. and accumulating good players. And you know, when you've got good players, you've got a chance. And I think Knotts have got good players without spending fortunes. Um, but I also see them other teams with good players as well. And that's not to say that the Boreham Woods and Halifaxes haven't got good players. They certainly have. Um, it's just they've done it a lot quieter with a lot less money. Uh, Zedo uh, kind of agrees with you in terms of the spending powers. Uh, to quantify, I think Stockport, Wrexham, Chesterfield have a large brackets, silly budget. Uh, are two out of those three going up? Not so long with a few others have a good budget. Dale Pike, it's been studying the fixtures. Stockport play five of the current top six in the last seven games of the season. There's a stat for you. Right. Rikey. Right, I, I, there'll be some good crowds with them games. Then, by the sounds of it, I would have thought. Oh, yeah, yeah. But again, you, you you've got to say, as far as knots are concerned, we are at the halfway point of the season. Yes. Twenty-two games. Yeah, we're halfway through, so we've got everything that's gone before still to come. And we've said Grimsby were flying; they were never going to be beat. Chesterfield were flying. Now it's Stockport that are flying, and I might miss somebody else out along the way. So there's every chance between now and the end of the season, there might be three other teams. And as we all know, it's only whoever's there at the end of the season after 44 games that really matters. And if you get there with a minute of the season to spare, we'll take it. Last kick of the season, that'll do us. You know, it's all about the end of the season. So, of course, form comes and goes. But I just see, I think we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, Paul, that the, the, the teams at the top were banging form you know, predominantly. Now, there's one or two anomalies now, but, you know, good teams win games. And and at this level, there's a bigger discrepancy between top and bottom. Over time, of course, we can get a result like last night uh, uh, that throws us a little bit, but the top teams will generally beat the bottom teams more often than not. So it's about who has the least slip-ups. But it's fascinating because it's so tight. It really is tight. Any team that wins four out of five, five on the spin, anything like that can give themselves a little bit of daylight at the top, but then they're there to be chased and then they're there to be caught. And then the pressure comes on when you actually hit the front. Can they handle front running? Stockport were, what, they're about ninth, tenth after we beat them? Mm, you know, not too long ago. Go on a great run, all of a sudden they're top of the tree. Granted, other teams have got games in hand, they might not be there for, for too much longer, but it's so tight that anybody... Anybody who can put a decent run of form, decent run of wins together, can just elevate themselves six, seven, eight places almost in a week or two. I mean, bizarrely, we, the, the league looked better for us when we didn't play, didn't it? All of a sudden, with our two games in hand, we could have gone joint top and yeah. top on goal difference. And now we play a game last night, we're not quite in this, as good a position. So I um, don't know whether we're better not playing or, or saving these games up. But again, it's all pie in the sky. All knots have got to focus on it is what they do. And the next game is Bromley. Go and win the game down at Bromley. 
Uh, okay, so Dale Pike is uh, is producing some great stats. So having explained to us that stock, I'll, 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 I'll regurgitate it. Stockport play five of the current top six in the last seven games of the season. He's now gone on to say, uh, from Notts' perspective, we play, you listen to this Dale, five of the bottom eight in the last six games of the season. And four of them are at home. There you go. Good. Great stat. <laughs> Great stat. He can write some stats for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, with them. The, the other side of that, of course, with half a season left is, if we're playing, was it five of the bottom eight in the last six games, it means that in the games before that, we've got the rest of the top yeah. end of the table. March is a big month when we play a lot of the, the clubs around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not yeah. like yeah. you, I'm not studying it too much. You know? no. And one thing as well, and I think fans need to sort of know this as well, is that the Stockport game, isn't it? Um, oh, I've got my diary there, but it, I think it won't that, be happening. Where it is, yeah, probably won't be happening. Should yeah. either Notts or Stockport win the FA Trophy uh, next round game? Stockport, Stockport or Cheshire, aren't they? Which I yeah. think is unlikely. Yeah, Unless so make that will be another Tuesday game. COVID, Al Chesterfield, uh, you would you would think they would get through that one. Yeah, you would think so, and and hope well. Hopefully, Notts will as well. So the game will be null and void anyway. But uh, yeah, so that's another another game that is likely to be shifted to a Tuesday night. Um, transfer window January, um, and I think like both of us, we we spoke about this before, and of course it's mm. ticking down, and really it's passing Notts by, which is no bad thing. Um, uh, you know, one or two fans. You know, scare stories. We're going to sell the best players. That's the sustainable model for the club. Owners have never said that. Uh, and no players have been sold. Um, do you anticipate any transfer activity? Uh, I've got to say, if you look across the football league, because a lot of the bigger clubs are looking at their players, it's been very flat, hasn't it? It's been, you know, and, and I think that's because post-COVID, clubs are counting the pennies, you know. And I think that the transfer market has now become very depressed from where it was. You know, the, the funny thing is, Wrexham are probably the biggest movers and shakers in the transfer market. Not only in this division, but League Two and probably League One as well. Yep. I mean, no, absolutely right. I think, I think you're right. I think obviously counting beans and all that sort of thing, it has played a played a part. And I think slowly, people are, or football people are getting to grips with the fact that the January transfer window doesn't unearth much value yeah, in players. On. You know, there, there's we started off years ago, however many years, you know, panic buys and. You know, it, what seemed like buying for the sake of buying. And I think over time, I think people have realised that the only players, well, not only, but majority of players that are available in January are not wanted by the clubs that they're at. And there, there's a reason for that, you know, for whatever reason that might be. But it's not ideal to sign somebody midway through a season coming into the final running where if they've not been having games and they're not fit, you haven't got a lot of time to get them up to speed. You know, if they're out of form or they're low on confidence, you don't know, get that back overnight very easily. Um, and if they're deemed surplus to requirements elsewhere, why is that? And why would you pay money to bring that into your football club? Now, a little bit different at, at National League level because you can go fishing in bigger ponds, if you like, for yep. surplus to requirement players. But even so, as we've seen, you know, there's still massive amounts of money being spent. You know, the, the rumoured £300,000 for Ollie Palmer, mm. um, who's a 30-year-old striker. Um, who's been around the block, uh, you know, a few times. Um, it shows you that people will still have a gamble at this level because the value of getting back into the football league, you know, is a is a big catch. It is a prize that is worth trying to win to some. Um, but there is no guarantee, and there's no guarantee you're bringing in real quality at this time of the year. And and so go back to knots. I don't see any activity whatsoever outside of a goalkeeper maybe coming in. So, I, but which I think would be a reasonably successful window. They brought Zach Brunt in, 
Again, another looks like a decent addition in the middle of the park. A goalkeeper coming in competition uh, with Sam and nobody going. I think we've got a strong a strong team for the running. A uh, bit of banter with Ian Birchall and Chris Gosling. Ian has uh, managed, and I didn't want to bring this one up when we were talking about Stockport are bound to beat Cheshunt. Um, but Ian has. Uh, you would have thought we'd have beaten Hornchurch, so you never oh. know. Uh, oh, and then we need brought up Halifax as well, which we try and erase yeah. uh, from our memory banks as well. And just for good measure, he's thrown in Coventry in the playoffs. And when you look where Coventry are now, Oh. Look where we are. I mean, that that's probably one of the unkindest puts of all as oh, to how all, you know, spin of a coin, you know, all the rest of it, yeah. how these things can suddenly go miles apart from when you're at each other's throats, which we were. Coventry, VAR have been there, Jonathan Fort, goal, all of that, you know, but all that's doing is making us even more frustrated with things. <laughs> um don't know whether he had a chance. And finally, we'll wrap up. Um, I don't know whether he had a chance uh, to see our um, one-on-one -on -one interview with Mark Ives, the National League general manager, which was actually a lot more revealing than I thought it would be. And he spoke a lot um, about all sorts of things. Um, but one of the lines was he spoke um, quite aggressively um, about an extra place, a prom extra promotion place. And um, the Sun newspaper have been on to me today uh, and they're doing a follow up on on his comments in the paper tomorrow or Friday. Um, and he said that I asked him about where is that, you know, expecting him to say, oh, that's, you know, it's a can being kicked down the road. We'd like to open the talks, blah. But he said that talks were actively ongoing uh, with the football league. Uh, uh, and he was very, very hopeful. And I said, like, short, medium or long term. And he said, well, it's not the long term. Yeah. So clearly the inference there is short to medium. Uh, look, he may be saying it. Uh, I don't know. Um, I do wonder if the National League don't get their act together and push for a third place, whether at any point with the number of bigger clubs that are now in the National League National Division, whether the Football League could make a strike to bring in 16, 18 clubs from the National League, the full-time ones, and make it uh, a four-division Football League. And then effectively the National League becomes National League North and South, and they're all part-time, bar one or two. But it is interesting because you, you would think uh, the size of crowds, the money being spent, TV... Uh, ratings for BT, you know, as as a as a vehicle, there's a lot going on in the National League, and it, you know, if we if we talk about the race for promotion in the National League, it's arguably garnering quite a bit more coverage than that in the in Football League Two at the minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I I didn't hear the interview, see the interview with him. Um, it's something that's been mooted for a number of years, though, isn't it? Like the the one up, well, two up, two down, and I don't know. I've not. I don't know the exact ramifications of whether the league put it out to vote because, again, if, are the clubs going to vote to have yeah. three drop out the that's, league? I, I yeah. don't see that anytime soon. Um, but you know, again, the ramification of it it would seem to make sense with all the money that seems to be around in the national league. What I would say. And, and obviously, we've got a vested interest because we want the quickest route out of there as possible. So open up more places gives us more chance, of course. What I would say is once you've got them clubs, theoretically, the money clubs, out of the National League and into the Football League, then what? Yeah. Because then you would think natural selection sort of thinks the money clubs will replace clubs without money at the bottom of League Two. Yeah. And then you end up with a conference or National League, you know, the main division full of clubs that haven't really got money. So it goes back to being a not amateur league, but it becomes back to being the, the haves and the have nots, if you like, at that level. But then what happens when there's still three going up and three coming down? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a great idea while nots are in it because, like I say, make, make it eight up while we're down there and then close the trap door once we're back in the league. But, um, it's interesting. It is interesting because it's an interesting point that's been raised for, for a number of years. But as somebody mentioned earlier 
on the comments that, um, you know, it's not been the money clubs that have been promoted in the last couple of years. Not necessarily your Harrogates, your Barrows, you know, teams like, yes, I know Salford had millions, but um, but the others, you know, uh, Sutton last year, you know, they were just good teams, well-run, good teams, good organised teams, got good players at that level. So, um, yeah, of course, we want Notts to get out as quick as possible, get back in the Football League. But it's, it's an interesting debate. I don't know what the um, legislation is in terms of how they would actually get that happen. I, I would imagine it's more than just a plea. It then gets put to a vote yeah. of the, the Football League board. And, and I'm sure they would probably canvass the members. Yeah, but, I, I think, mm, don't know. I, I, I agree. I, I think it is still a stretch. Um, I think if you could get the numbers to stack up from a, from a revenue perspective, i.e. TV deals, yeah, centralised sponsorships. Yeah. I think there's more merit to expand the Football League. I think there's more merit to expand the Football League because that effectively then catches 95% of all the full-time professional football clubs. And then you have that, and then you have your ground selection criteria. Because it, and I think someone just put this in somewhere here uh paul i wondered this is from andrew blatherwick i wonder if there will be a possibility for eight up and have four divisions of 20 in line with the premier league it's an interesting one um i think the, the principle the only way ultimately that you get the football league to buy in to expanding their portfolio or increasing the number of places uh, between the National League and the Football League is if you can demonstrate collectively that by increasing most probably television rights and pot and then that gets divided up among more clubs but the overall money divided means the clubs are still in on the deal you know that's that's the way yeah you get it through that's the way you get it through I think um I think the one dynamic that's changed in the last three or four years, and you produce the stats on these as you always do, is that the National League clubs going up aren't coming back down. Even, and let's be honest, we would have all had a banker team to come down, Sutton. Never been in the league before, small little club, no pedigree, no history. They're not just third bottom. They're thriving. They're thriving. You know, we could hardly name a bloody player. You know, on the face of it last season, their best player was the lone guy from Millwall. You know, they're thriving. And what you are seeing at the minute, you're not seeing those really small football league clubs, Morecambe's, who got promoted down at the bottom. You're looking this season, someone's just mentioned it in Birchinall, as it stands, Alderman Scunthorpe, are in absolute pole positions to drop out, like Southend, like Notts County, like Chesterfield. These are clubs who have never not been in the football league. Yeah, um, so it, it is. It shows that things are changing. It shows that just because you know the, the old ninety-two football league clubs, which is now seventy-two, obviously since the Premier League broke away, um, you know things are changing. And with the promotion from National League, again, you look at the clubs, you look at the clubs that have gone in there and not struggled, you know. And again, look at the National League with the history of the clubs in there, as we've said on many an occasion. There is, it's almost a changing of the guard, you know, and it shows that no team's got divine rights to anything and anybody is vulnerable. You, you look down the road at, at Derby, you know, yeah. that their absolute existence is you know, in the balance at this moment in time, just like Berry and Macclesfield, but by, you know, than, than them, but they're in real, real trouble. Um, so I think the danger with football, with a lot of things in life, it is you have to move and adapt or you die. And so things are changing. Now, whether that change, I mean, it would, you'd have to do a heck of a lot. I mean, we've not, not spoke about this before about what we do about is it should it be three up three down or or what you should do but there would have to be some serious thought into the ramifications of what happens both to the league does it make you know much difference to the football league as a as a as a package to the media companies because 
let's let's face it, we're behest to the media companies exactly. putting their money in to keep clubs afloat. You know, fans' money is brilliant and all that, but they, the clubs rely on media money and sponsorship that that brings and, and all that sort of stuff. So even if you went three up, three down, or if you put an extra eight in there to, to make it up to 80, four leagues of 20, um, is that enough of a, you know, you're then going to have what, championship, league one, league two, league three. Um, is that enough of a selling point that a TV company is going to go, you know, sky as it is at the minute, go, go yeah, we'll have that. Yeah, that, that makes significant interest because it brings in the likes of Notts County, Wrexham, Stockport, or they might just look at it and go, "Yeah, it's pretty much the same as what it was mm. in terms of in terms of teams." But BT Sport might go, "Well, we ain't bothered about the National League after that. If you cherry pick all the better clubs out of it, the National League becomes a well, dare I say it, a, a sort of Scottish league, if you like, beyond the Premier League. You know, it, it you've it's it's great, and obviously we we've got a a vested interest in wanting the best route out of it for nuts." Yeah. But I think what's good for football, I don't know. But I, but I do think these things should be looked at regularly. Don't just go with it because that's what we've done. We had 92 football league clubs. And, oh, they never changed that. It did. It changed. The Premier League broke away. Yeah. Now, you know, there is a question. And if, if the guy from the National League is saying, you know, short to medium term, this is going to be a serious conversation, then good. It should always be being looked at. Football should always be looked at to see can it be made better not better for one individual club or a couple of individual clubs but better as a whole for for the clubs but for the fans let's not forget the clubs are always for the fans mm. and you know when berry went out macclesfield went out you know horrible seeing the stories that the fans put on you know i've got no allegiance to either of them clubs but well other than playing there and playing you know playing against them but to see fans lose their club is soul destroying we've had it at not something we've so you know close we've been close to that on a couple of occasions it that's that's just heartbreaking in terms of, of let's say football being the community asset and now it's it's derby obviously a, a club that i started at and a place that i know particularly well um and you just think well this could send ramifications through if it gets really really even more serious than it is because they're a, a big club. They're the biggest club probably that is being talked about in this way in recent years, certainly since the Premier League began. And finally, um, Ian Birchinell, uh, we've not mentioned Mark Ellis going to Solihull. Good move for Moores. Uh, not sure we needed him, although a good player for us when he was here. Surprised at that or obviously being reunited with Neil Ardley? Yeah, well, not particularly surprised. I don't think he was playing regularly at Barrow. Um, he, although he was skipper there, I, I, he played a fair bit, but I think I think there's a geographic element to it as well. Um, but also, Neil Ardley knows him well, knows he came in and did a really good job uh, at Notts and a good signing for Solihull, a really good signing for Solihull. So, um, yeah, Solihull, one of them teams, again, they're strengthening. So it just makes that top eight to nine just really, really competitive. And look, there's going to be, they're all going to have to play each other at time. We're talking about who's playing the bottom teams, who's playing the top teams. All these teams are going to have to play each other. So there'll be points dropped left, right and centre. And it's going to make fascinating second half of the season, that's for sure. Um, we will both be off to Bromley on Saturday. Um, we are also fortunate enough to be able to uh, um, attend uh, Colin Slater's um, funeral yep. at St Mary's on Monday lunchtime. Uh, and I'm sure there will be um, a huge turnout of the great and the good for Colin on the Monday. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think they're, they're finalising that there's a sort of a procession, isn't they, past the ground, um, you know, and, and sorting the route out to the church. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, as I say, I'll be there and I know everybody will want to turn out as much as possible. And, you yeah, know, disappointing that the game against Grimsby was postponed, yeah. you know, but ironically, the game being on a Saturday, hopefully there'll be there'll be even more for the uh, the Grimsby game for the tributes there. But, yeah, I hope Monday goes, you know, he gets the send off. Well, he, he, he more than deserves. So I'm sure people will want to pay their respects and pay their tributes. 
thank you mark uh thank you everyone for your participation tonight uh great chat and debate as always um i'm sure that plenty of us will be heading down to south london and bromley on saturday hopefully we can get back to um winning ways thank you again to everybody uh look forward to catching up again very soon cheers